Hey everyone, welcome to Worship at the Rock. We are so excited that you could be with us tonight. Tonight we have Pastor John bringing us the full gospel Torah portion, then Messianic Pastor Jim will finish off the night with the teaching. Now, please join us for a weekly full gospel Torah portion with Pastor John. Hi, I'm Pastor John, and I am blessed to be bringing you this week's full gospel Torah portion right here at Worship at the Rock. Now, this week we are doing an extended portion, and we are also going to be doing communion, so please make sure to get your communion elements ready by the end of this Torah portion. Um, this Torah section is entitled Tzav, which means command, and our Torah section comes out of Leviticus chapters 6 through 8. Our um, half Torah section is out of Malachi chapter 3, and our gospel portion is out of Matthew chapter 9. And please spend some time reading these sections. It's not a lot of verses, and it's a very quick read. I am going to be reading to you out of Leviticus chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 24, and this is out of the ESV if you want to follow along. And starting in verse 24, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. Now, I want to pause for a moment here and have you just think for a moment about the fact that the sin offering, the ultimate offering for our sins, the blood sacrifice that saves us from our sins today is, you guessed it, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Jesus. And because of his sacrifice, we don't have to make these sin offerings like they did back in the day. So let's pick up there. The priest who offers it, the sin offering that is, for sin shall uh, eat it. Okay? <clears throat> so the lamb, perfect lamb that was sacrificed for the sin, the priest who offers it will also eat it. Okay? In a holy place it shall be eaten, in the court of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall be holy. Okay, so Jesus Christ, whatever touches his flesh shall be holy. And when any of its blood is splattered on a garment, you shall wash that on uh, which it was splashed in a holy place. Now, they get into a lot more, but I'm going to pause there. Why does the garment need to be washed in a holy place if the blood gets on it? Because the blood is also holy. Right? So think about Jesus Christ, Yeshua Jesus, and his blood, his body was holy. Does this remind you of anything? To me, it reminds me of the Last Supper. Unfortunately, the Last Supper is not in this Torah portion, but you know what? I am going to jump right over there, and we're going to take a quick look at it. Okay? Now, in Luke chapter 22, I, I like the way that Luke describes the Last Supper. And... Matthew and Mark, they both discuss the same issues, but Luke gets into a lot more detail. I really like how he puts it. So we're just going to start reading in verse 1. And this is out of the New Living Translation. It says in 22 verse 1 of Luke, The festival of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover, was approaching. The leading priests and teachers of the religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Now this uh, portion about Judas... Um, betraying Jesus, going to the priests, and all of this is in Matthew and Mark. But Luke does a phenomenal job explaining this. Verse 3 says, Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples. And he went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, and they promised to give him money. The 30 pieces of silver, remember? So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. Now, the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? 
He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything, just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it amongst yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. Then they began to argue amongst themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Jesus told them, In this world, the kings and great men lord, or the kings and great men that lord over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me in my time of trial, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, we get it, it, it continues on to talk about how Jesus will, Jesus predicts Peter's denial and goes and P, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray. Now, we know that Judas Iscariot, based upon this passage, that he is already possessed by Satan. And it doesn't say that he is demon-possessed, that he, Satan has entered into his body. Jesus is the Son of God. He is holy. And he knew that Judas was filled with Satan. He could see it. The, others, the other disciples couldn't. You know, something that I don't think... I don't think a lot of people like to think about. And, and in this passage, and I'll, I'll skip back over to it here, that it says here in, oh, where is it? Verse 21. So Jesus has already done the cup of wine and the bread and the second cup. He's already said, this is my blood. This is my body. This is the new covenant. He's already passed it around and shared it. Judas was there. Satan was present. Satan thought he was getting away with something. Since when does Satan ever get away with anything, right? Here's the thing. When we look at the offerings out of Leviticus, I didn't get into all of the little things that they made. But one of the things that they made was the knife that was used to slaughter, butcher, kill these sacrificial lambs. You know, the sacrifices had to die. Somehow, they had to bleed them out because it was, they, they couldn't just put a live animal on the altar and torture it to death. 
and they couldn't leave the blood in the animal because that would be wrong. They needed to bleed it out. It's not healthy to leave the blood in. You know, because the priests ate some of these sacrifices or a portion of them. Now, think about this. The knife that's used, I'll see if I have one handy. Ah, here we go. The knife that's used to slice the throat of the animal is a holy thing. It was something that was made for a purpose. You know, I don't, I don't use this knife very often, but I bought it for a purpose. Now, its purpose is, is more of a decorative piece. Don't use it. Now, I'm a contractor. So this is the type of knife, utility knife, that I would use on a regular basis. This is, for me, this is a tool. It's very handy. Change the blades out when they start to get dull, things like that. Okay? A great, a great knife to have for work. This type of a knife, kind of hard to sharpen it if you get it dull doing work. So not the kind of knife I'm going to carry with me on a regular basis, right? Now, the priests had a knife that they used for the sacrifices. It was still a holy thing. Judas, and Jesus flat out says, um, let's see here in verse 22, for it has been determined that the Son of Man must die, but what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? Meaning it's worse, it is horrible. It's going to be horrible for the man who betrays the Son of God. But you know what? There is a purpose, a plan. Now Satan was the one that was manipulating Judas. Judas I'm sure, was willing for, to allow Satan to come in. But Satan got in. Now, Satan is not pure and holy. But you know what? He had, there, there was a reason God allowed this to happen. God ordained all of this to happen. Judas, as much, for as wrong as it was for him to betray Yeshua Jesus, He's just like the knife that has a purpose. The purpose might be to do the dirty work, but he still had a purpose. Satan, every step he takes, God is so much further ahead of him. He has a plan in place. And how does that relate back to you and your life? God has a plan in place for your life. The people in your life, the Judases in your life, the people who betray you, that stab you in the back, maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe instead of blaming others and the, playing the woe is me card, maybe instead of saying, God, why don't you stop this? Maybe he's allowing it to happen. You know, we see in the story of Job how God allowed Job to be persecuted and go through everything that he went through. That Satan was the one that was pulling the trigger. God allowed it to happen to an extent. In this case here, God allowed Judas to be filled with, the, with Satan and come after Jesus and turn him over. And God could have rescued Jesus at any point in time, but he didn't. Yeshua Jesus had to die on the cross for our sins. The sacrificial lamb had to die so that we could have the blood and the body so that we can be made clean by the blood. We can be purified and covered in the blood so that our sins can be washed away. So that we can eat of the body so that we can be made holy. Without being made holy in the eyes of God, without being made pure and clean in his eyes, we are all destined for hell. Passover is coming up. And I know we're going to be teaching more on Passover. But think about this. When we take these communion elements, which we're going to be doing in a moment, when we take these communion elements, 
just like on that first Passover, where they slaughtered the lamb, the pure and innocent lamb, and they drained the blood, just like the priests would have drained the blood from the sacrifice, their sacrifices. And then they would have taken that blood with a brush or their hands, something. And they would have wiped it on the doorposts. And the spirit, the angel of the Lord, I should say, came by and would pass over your house if the blood of the lamb was on the doorposts. The same, the same angel, spirit of death, if you want to call it, you know, we all have sin in our lives. We all deserve to die. You know, Adam and Eve were told that they would die. Basically, that they would have sin in their lives and they would be dead on the inside. And they would eventually go to hell. If the Father, if our Father God in heaven didn't have another plan. Jesus Christ is that plan. And without his sacrifice, we would all be going to hell. When we take of our communion, as Jesus says, to take this, this in remembrance of me. We are taking this and we are smearing that blood on the doorpost and saying, we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Death cannot find us. We do not go to hell. Now the rest of this passage gets into and the way we should be living our lives. Tonight we're just talking about just getting to heaven. Taking the blood and the body. Being made holy. Pure. Living lives for Christ. We're not talking about that tonight. You look, at, look up some of our other videos. I believe last week um, I spoke about the having, getting your priorities right. That's a little bit more about how to live your life. All right. Let's get back into this here. We are going to go back and do our communion now. Okay. So in verse 17, Luke chapter 22. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this and share it amongst yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the king, uh, kingdom of God has come. Lord, thank you so much that you died on the cross and gave us this opportunity to partake of your your blood, your wine, together, that we can be made pure. Our sins are forgiven because of the sacrifice of your Son, Yeshua Jesus. Thank you so much for this opportunity, for the forgiveness of my sin, for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Partake of the wine together. Okay, now, in verse 20, or I'm sorry, in verse 19, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you so much that we can symbolically take the same bread that you broke. That this is your body, symbolically taking your body and touching this flesh, just like in our, in, out of Leviticus, that we can touch the flesh of the sacrificial lamb that has died and risen from the dead, that we can make, made, be made holy, not just pure, but holy, so that we can enter into the kingdom of heaven, not just by skating by, not just by the blood and because of our sins being forgiven, but also because we are holy. As only you, Father, can be holy. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son and giving us this way that we can be made pure and holy despite the sin of our past. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take the bread together.
<clears throat> All right. Well, that's it for tonight. If you want to hear his voice clearly, you have to clearly understand his word. The Bible is his word. Read it, understand it, and keep it close to your heart. Until next week, friends, Shabbat Shalom. Please join us as we dig in a little deeper with a time of teaching with Pastor Jim. Hi, hey everybody. This is Pastor Jim with Worship at the Rock Ministries. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the trial of Yeshua Jesus. And many of the Jewish laws, trial laws, were broken by the Sanhedrin when they held this trial. A lot of people will say it was a kangaroo court, but just the things that went on and happened show that Yeshua Jesus was the Messiah because things that happened were predicted in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and, and especially Isaiah. So we're going to uh, start now. The Jewish Sanhedrin broke 22 of the Jewish trial laws in order to have Jesus of Nazareth executed by Roman crucifixion. Now, last week we talked about the final Last Supper going into the garden and how the cohort came to arrest him. And that fits in with what uh, Pastor John was talking about, Judas and his job. So there were many things that were done that all come together because all of the scriptures that prophesied and spoke of Messiah had to be fulfilled. And then Yeshua's last words were, it is finished, meaning it's all done. So tonight's uh, notes came from Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum's research, volume four, Yeshua, the life of Messiah from a Messianic Jewish perspective on pages four through 12. So it lists all of these. And that's when I was studying uh, one time when I was taking or going to take doctoral classes, I was introduced to Arnold Frutenbaum and his research. And his research came, a lot of this came from research done by uh, another doctor in Messianic study back in the 1880s. Okay, Judas was bribed by members of the Sanhedrin, by the priests, with 30 pieces of silver. And this is strictly against the Mishnah law forbids that any authorities are affected by a bribe. In other words, you're not supposed to do it, but they did it anyway. And when you look at it, if you go to Zechariah, it talks about the 30 pieces of silver, and we're going to get into this later. And it's in the prophets, it's in Moses, it's in the law, it's in the poetry, the poetry being Psalms and Proverbs, but mostly Psalms. Hey, Judas appeared before the Roman governor or cohort to lead them to arrest Jesus of Nazareth. So Judas, when Jesus sent him out, as John was talking about it tonight, Jesus sent him out, and yes, woe to him, because he had to go before the Roman governor and ask for a cohort. And captains of the guard and officers of the court from the temple went with them. And it was a cohort of 400 to 600 people. Okay, Judas pointed out Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus said, 
friend? Do you betray me with a kiss? Now we know in Zechariah later, and we may bring this in tonight, that they're going to ask him when he comes back to the house of Israel, what are those scars in your hands and in your feet and in your side? And Yeshua will say, and this is in Zechariah, they're the scars that are received in the house of my friends. So it is kind of important that when Judas went to kiss Jesus, he says, friend, you betray me with a kiss. And that was also in the Psalms. Judas realized he had betrayed an innocent man and tried to return that silver to the priest, hanged himself, and with the money, and we'll talk about this later, they bought the field of blood, and Judas was the first one buried in it, officially. So the second and third law is broken, and the first one was you can't use a bribe. Second and third law is broken. The arresting band carried torches and lamps, so it was dark. Second law, no steps of criminal proceeding can be carried out after dark. So it was definitely dark. They were carrying torches when they got him. And a Roman cohort came to get him. And that consists of 400 to 600, which is a tenth of a legion. Melech, the servant of the high priest, was sent with the cohort because the high priest couldn't come with him because he didn't want to be declared unclean, and he knew he wasn't supposed to be doing it, but other priests and elders came along to make sure everything went according to their plan. So uh, what does Simon Peter do? He pulls out a long knife and cuts off the ear, Melek's ears on the ground, Yeshua Jesus picks it up and puts it back on him, and he's completely healed. And uh, he's, we'll get to what happens next. So Luke twenty two fifty two mentions the captains of the temple, the chief priests, the Sadducees, the elders, the Pharisees were part of the group that came to arrest Jesus of Nazareth. And the third law broken is judges... The ones that are going to judge this person or well, members of the Sanhedrin were not allowed to participate in the arrest. And they did. So that's the law number three that was broken. The arrest of Yeshua. He asked the band, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. And you're talking... 400 to 600 people fall backwards? I think I'd leave that person alone if that happened. All he said was, I am. And then he says, who are you looking for? I said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. I am he. So let all these go. So with that, it fulfills the prophecy. I believe it's in Psalms that says, of the ones you gave me, I lost none, and none of them were lost. Of course, Judas hangs himself later, but not yet. No. The 11 disciples flee. Jesus is bound and taken away to Annas' house. Annas, the father-in-law to the high priest Caiaphas? Yeah, they took him to Annas first. First stage of the trial is to determine the charges will be held at the house of the high priest, Caiaphas. So they went to Annas first, then they went to Caiaphas. And we're going to talk about the reason why later in our discussion and in, in the lesson of why they went to the retired high priest first. So they go to Caiaphas. Uh, all right, we're going to do it now. Annas the high priest from 6 to 14 AD. Now we know it's around 33 
AD, 32, 33 AD, somewhere around that time frame. So Annas was high priest from 6 to 14. And then four to five of his sons served as high priest. Sometimes it was just for a couple of years. But they basically were buying the high priesthood from the Romans. They were followed, the four to five sons and Annas were followed by Joseph Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law to the high priest. And, and Caiaphas led the Sanhedrin that convicted Yeshua Jesus. He had prophesied earlier, isn't it expedient that one should die for the entire nation so that we're not all wiped out by the Romans? They were really upset and stressed by when, when, when Yeshua came into town into Jerusalem riding the colt of a donkey and everybody was laying the palms down and singing and crying Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, meaning this is the Messiah. They were celebrating the Messiah coming into town. And this had been prophesied by Daniel with the 70 weeks prophecy. So that's why they had started plotting to put him away when that happened. All right, Annas had set up in the temple area the bazaar of the sons of Annas. It was a bazaar, and it was play. It was a place where the money changers could exchange Roman and people were coming from all over the world, Ethiopia, Syria. And they all had different kinds of money. So that money was exchanged so that they could pay their temple tax and pay for their sacrifices. You had to do it in temple money. So they had to exchange all those different forms of money for temple money. And of course, they kept a little bit, you know, as a profit for making the exchange in the bankers. The, ba the bazaar also sold the perfect sacrifices. Trouble is, and the reason why when Yeshua Jesus first started his ministry, he came in, knocked over the money changers, and kicked the people that were selling these sacrifices out. Well, he did it again. Here he comes in, riding the donkey, Hosanna to this, uh, the son of David, to Yeshua HaMashiach. Ben David, well, he was first coming in as a suffering servant. Yeshua HaMashiach, Ben. It'll come to me, sorry. Um, Joseph, sorry. It was uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Ben. Joseph, the suffering servant, that came first. And he was coming in as a suffering servant on the lowly donkey's colt, as it proclaimed in Psalms about him. So the reason why he was upset with them for the perfect sacrifices is, well, here's this pretty little lamb, and it's blemish-free and perfect, and the person pays the money for that lamb, and presses his hands on that lamb so the sins of his family are transferred to that lamb. And that lamb's supposed to be taken and sacrificed in the bloodshed for that man and his family's sins. But they were doing a little more than that. They were running that, taking the sheep to the back, and somebody bring another lamb. If it was a perfect one, they might take it to the back and they put it out there to be sold again. So they were recycling these perfect lambs. And eventually sometime that day, they did sacrifice those lambs. But you know, one lamb was supposed to take care of the sins for a family, but it was getting multiple families. So they were making out good. And uh, that's why Yeshua Jesus took that cord of, of 
rope and whipped them out and knocked over their tables and sent them packing out of the temple. You're making my father's house a den of thieves. All right, the fourth broken law. There were no, there were to be no trials before the morning sacrifice at 9 a.m. So at 9 a.m., that's the time they put Yeshua up on the cross. So there weren't supposed to be any trials before 9 a.m. in the morning, and definitely not at night. The rooster crowed three times as, you know, approximately 6 o'clock when uh, Peter denied the Lord. The rooster crowed the third time. All right, the fifth law broken was there was not to be any secret trials, only public ones during the day after the morning sacrifice. All right, six, seven, eight, nine laws broken. The Sanhedrin trials should only be held in the hall of judgment and the temple. They had it at Caiaphas' house. During the trial, the defense speaks before the prosecutors. For the accusations and writes to the charges and writes to two or three witnesses, but it didn't work out that way. They went right into the accusations. All could argue for acquittal, but not all could argue for conviction. And all of them said, he's guilty. You know, the accused has to have at least one advocate for him and no one advocated for Yeshua Jesus at his trials. Number nine, there were to be two to three witnesses questioned separately and the details had to match. They had to line up with their stories as far as what they're witnessing to and they, these, these witnesses could not line up the facts. They couldn't keep their facts exact with each other. And the reason is Judas that betrayed him had gone to the governor Pilate for cohort to go arrest Jesus. And of course, some elders and priests went along with him to do this thing. And uh, if you read in Zechariah 11, 13, you'll see where it even predicted that the betrayer was going to hang himself. Okay? So Judas, after Yeshua Jesus was arrested and taken away, realized, I betrayed an innocent man. He goes back to the priest. I betrayed an innocent man. Here's your money. And they wouldn't take it because it's blood money. And so he throws it down and goes out and hangs himself. Now, I know somebody said that they had uh, studied about Judas in Sunday school a week or two back. And yes, he hanged himself. But it also said his guts gushed out all over the rocks. But what he did was he hung himself and the rope was hanging off the wall of the temple. And he went out and hung himself there. And he was just hanging dead. And that makes the temple and the city of Jerusalem unclean. So somebody, probably one of the temple guards, took their knife or sword and cut the rope. And Judas' body fell down. And that was where his guts gushed out. So both things are true and both things happened. But there was an order of the way it went. The witness did not match in their testimonies. And the same thing when we see the public trial before Pilate and Herod, the original witness isn't there because Judas hanged himself. He was dead and the money had been given back to the priests. And we will see this later, but Zechariah eleven thirteen tells the tale. <clears throat> Yes, it's right now. And the Lord said unto me, cast it, the 30 pieces of silver, unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of them by. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter, 
in the house of the Lord. And that's what Judas did. He threw the money down and they purchased the potter's lot so that they could put indigent people there. Judas returned the 30 pieces of silver to the temple priests, threw it at their feet because they refused to take back the blood money, the betrayal money, saying, I have betrayed an innocent man. They said, well, we got to do that. We don't care that you betrayed an innocent man. We're not taking the money. So he went out and hung himself. The priest could not put the blood money into the treasury of the temple, so they bought the potter's land for indigent people. And Judas may have been the first one buried in the field of blood. Broken laws 10 through 15. Number 10, there was no allowance for the accused to witness against himself. In other words, you couldn't be asked to witness against yourself. And that's the main reason they contend. They condemn Yeshua Jesus because he was asked by God. You know, the, the high priest said, for the love of God, or he phrased it some way, and Yeshua Jesus responded back, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God. And that's it. The priest is forbidden to tear his garments and show emotions. He just ripped his vestiture and says, you see, he's blasphemed. He should die. The judges could not initiate the charges. They could only investigate them, and they had to be impartial. And yet, they had taken sides and figured out a kangaroo court before he was even collected by the cohort. The accusation of blasphemy could only be used if the name of God was pronounced. Yeshua didn't use the name of God. He said, Messiah, son of man, that would be seated at the right hand of God. So he didn't blaspheme. And they wanted him to say, yeah, I'm the son of God. But he just gave that statement. The son of man will be seated at the right hand of God. And you will see it happen. A person could not be condemned on the basis of his own words. This is law 14. And that's why the two witnesses were needed. And they didn't line up in their testimony. The verdict could not be announced at night. It was still dark. It had to be announced in the daylight. 16, the case, in the case of capital punishment, the trial and guilty verdict could not occur immediately. You had to give it a 24-hour cooling time in between the declaration of guilty and the sentencing. All right. Number 17, voting for death had to be done individually, starting with the youngest of the judges, so that the Older ones don't influence the young ones. You know how it is with the younger people. They would tend to go along with what grandpa said or something like that. And they all cried out at once, guilty. A unanimous decision for guilt is considered impossible. How can you get 23 people, <clears throat> 23 to 71 men, to agree on anything? It was a stacked deck. It had to be at least that one that was advocating for his innocence, and it was unanimous. The sentence can only pronounce three days after the verdict, and it came immediately. Crucify him. Kill him. The judges were to be humane and kind. The person condemned was not to be beaten or scourged before his execution. Yet that's what Pilate did to try to get him off. And you'll see when we cover that. 22, no trials were allowed on the eve of a Sabbath or a feast day. And this was definitely the eve of the Sabbath. Actually, it was on the Sabbath because the Sabbath starts the night before and goes through that day. Okay.
So everybody at the trial, all the priests, and elders, and scribes, and people that were there that convicted Yeshua Jesus, they either spit on him, smacked him, pressed their hands on, oh, pressed their hands like they pressed their sins from their family onto the lamb that's to be sacrificed. Yeah, that's what they did. They handled him, pressed their hands on Yeshua, or spit on him, which was a transfer of their sins too, because he died. He was the perfect sacrifice. We've spoken over the weeks how he was born as a lamb to be slaughtered. And when when John talked about the sacrifice Tonight, he talked about the blood being drained out. And we will see after the scourgings and everything on the cross, when Yeshua Jesus was on the cross, that he bled out and his heart stopped. And then when they pierced him, water and blood came out separately. So he'd been dead for a little while, but his heart had basically stopped. He kind of bled to death. Just like a perfect lamb. All right. Roman trial rules. They're going to Pilate. Must be in public. The accusers present formal charges. Number three, the accused is questioned. And then there's a pronouncement of judgment. So what happens? Judas was dead. The one that got the cohort. So there were no witnesses to ask for the cohort, but the priests were ready. They had their witnesses coming, and they came, and they made their accusations before Pilate. Pilate questioned Jesus to see if he were the king of the Jews and if he planned to overthrow Caesar, because those are the trumped-up charges that they were throwing at Pilate. This man is... Messing up society. And he claims to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate's wife had already told him, don't have nothing to do with this innocent man that they're bringing before you. And he didn't really want much to do with it. And he was going to figure out a way. He's a politician. He's going to figure out a way to get out from under it. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? And Yeshua, Jesus says, thou hast said, or you're saying this because they're saying that of me. And he could see this man is not plotting to overthrow Caesar or the Roman authority. So, number four, Pilate finds Yeshua, Jesus, innocent of sedation against Rome. And then they cry out things that he's not a friend of Rome um, and and this man from Galilee is just causing problems and Pilate being the politician that he was knowing that his wife had told him don't have nothing to do with this because I had bad dreams about it says Galilee oh you need to be going before Herod who is over Galilee and Syria so Pilate sees him out, and he sends him to Herod Antipas. So, trial before Herod Antipas. See, Herod and Pilate up to this time were kind of ruling their own little areas, and it was kind of like a little friction there. They didn't like each other too much. But Herod had wanted to meet Yeshua Jesus because he heard about all the miracles. So, uh, Pilate and Herod became friends after that day because Pilate allowed Herod to judge Jesus. And so Herod was in town for the Passover and was staying in the family castle. You know, that's right in Jerusalem. See, his daddy, Herod, Herod the Great, had uh, married the princess, queen of parents, of the Maccabee family. The Maccabees had been high priests and basically high priest rulers 
in Jerusalem for years. Then here comes Herod. He gets appointed by Rome to be king over the great, Herod the Great, over all these areas. And then it's split up between his sons and that kind of thing. And uh, so they were in the house of the Maccabees. And uh, old robes from the Maccabean high priests were hanging on the walls and stuff. So Herod's soldiers knew the charge was that they were claiming Jesus was king of the Jews. So they took the Maccabean high priest's robe, stripped him and put him in the robe, and put a crown of thorns on his head, and gave him that reed like he's king, and start saying, oh, king of the Jews. Excuse me. And so they blindfolded him, smacked him around, pulled his beard, spit on him, and called him, Hail, King of the Jews. And uh, Herod interrogated Yeshua Jesus, and he decided hmm, he's innocent. There's nothing here. He's not a danger to Rome. And he sends him back to Pilate. The Pilate thought he got rid of the problem. Boom, there it is. Final trial before Pilate. The chief priests were not going to give up on this. It was like a bulldog with a bone. They weren't going to have that bulldog bone ripped out of their teeth. They were going to go after it full force. <clears throat> Pilate didn't want to crucify him. So he came up with the scheme I'll have him scourged. We will have that man whipped like a, like one stroke short of his life. And with the can of nine tails and 39 stripes, you know, Isaiah had said, by his stripes, you were healed. And in Matthew, it says, by his stripes, you were healed. But in Second Peter, it says, by his stripes, you are healed. Because the price had already been paid. But getting back to this, uh, he brings Yeshua out and says, behold the man. I find no fault in him. And the priests go nuts up. They press for death. And Pilate offers, it's that time of year, the Passover. So he offers up the king of the Jews or Barabbas, which uh, was a convicted killer that was to be executed today. So bottom line, the crowd is whipped up into calling for Barabbas to be set free for the Passover Sabbath kiss. Remember the scapegoat? At this time, the scapegoat, two goats were selected. The ribbon was put around the neck of the scapegoat. And the other goat was sacrificed. And then the scapegoat was sent out. And the blood on, from the sacrifice was put on the scapegoat. And, and it's a red blood-soaked ribbon, I guess. And that turns white when it's accepted. So long and short of it, this is the scapegoat situation when Barabbas is offered up because he, along with the other two male factors that were sacrificed with Yeshua Jesus that day, well, they let Barabbas go free. So somebody's got to go up on that third cross. And the one in the middle was the big dog of the three. So Yeshua Jesus was going in the middle. So the priests shout that Pilate is no friend of Caesar if he doesn't convict. Pilate washes his hands and says, I'm free and innocent of this man's blood. This blood is on your heads. And the priests and the Jews say, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar is our king. Not this Yeshua. And uh, 
how it turns Yeshua over to the executioner. And that's a centurion that has a band of men that take him off to be sacrificed and, and to be executed. We're going to end with the closing prayer, was as we always do, but next week we're going to take up the rest of the story as far as the execution because Yeshua is taken out to be put on the cross and he goes on the cross at 9 a.m. the time of the morning sacrifice. So Messiah Yeshua is on the cross at 9 until 3 the time of the evening sacrifice. And that's when his body has drained out of blood and pretty much he's died. And the veil of the temple is rent open, meaning that you and I can have access to Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh that dwells in us. And we've talked a lot about the Ruach HaKodesh that dwells in us, meaning the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And we're going to have another lesson after the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we'll talk more about the promise of the Father. So let's have our closing prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord protect you and keep you under his wings of protection. The Lord give you through his Holy Spirit that he guides you. The Lord's kindness and love track you down and allow you and your family to abide in his shalom peace that passes all understanding. May he bless and keep you always in the mighty name of Yeshua Jesus, amen. Shabbat Shalom. joining us for another amazing night of worship and diving into the Word of God. We hope to see you next week for another wonderful night of teaching. Thank you so much to all of our friends and partners for your prayers and financial support. The best way you can give is to go to graceandtruthmagazine.com, select donations, then online giving. Your prayers and financial support are what empower us to keep building the kingdom. What we sow today comes back in our tomorrow as an amazing harvest. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom.